XPS times over 9,000. All right, so what's that mean? Well, with, uh, with cross-protocol scripting, what we're doing is we're essentially, we're tricking the browser into what protocol it's communicating with. What we're gonna do with NAT ping is we're gonna trick the router into what it's communicating. So, if you guys remember from a few years ago, what would happen is you'd, if you tried to FTP somewhere and you tried to download a file, it wouldn't work. Now, what was happening was FTP is a multi-port protocol. You'd connect to an FTP server, your NAT would allow that through, and you'd say, hey, I wanna download this file. Once you connected that FTP server on port 21, to download the file, you'd actually say, connect back to me on port 12345 and send me the content of that file. The FTP server would say, okay, and it would try to connect back, but that NAT would be in the way. And the NAT would say, I don't know what port 12345 is. I'm not gonna allow you through. So router vendors got smart, right? They want a good user experience for their customers. So they started creating connection tracking code. And what that connection tracking code does is it looks to, it monitors connections. It says, oh wow, I see a connection going out on port 21. That's an FTP connection. If I see my internal user request a file on, let's say, an incoming port, I better open that port up and port forward it back to my user. In fact, you can do the same thing with IRC. IRC has something called uh, DCC, where you can do a direct connection for chatting or for sending files. It works the same way. You say, I want to chat this person, I want to chat you, but I want it to be direct. Connect back to me on port 12345. And again, the routers got smart and they said, we want these IRC connections to work. So we're going to port forward that port right back open. Well, what if we use the same method as cross-protocol scripting and we connect to that IRC server again? But instead of spamming pound teen chat, we just send a message that says, DCC chat, this person, port 12345. What does the router do? The router sees Anna making a connection out to an IRC server. It says, oh, I know IRC. I know port 6667. I better interpret, I better uh, start monitoring that connection. Then it sees a DCC request and says, oh, DCC request. I better port forward that incoming port. Well, I'm the one who created the web page. I'm the one who created this form and forced Anna to submit it just by coming to my website. So what if I change that port to 22? And what if I included a couple more messages in there, like, I don't know, port 21, 23, 25, 80, 443, 139, 138, 137, 1024, and 65,530 other ports, approximately. <laughs> I would make that router port forward every single port back to Anna. Every single port. Here's the code. That's it. That's all you have to do. The router will interpret that code, it'll, or it'll interpret the private messages and say, oh, these are DCC requests. I better let this stuff back in. It opens those ports up, and now anyone from the public can attack every single port and see what services are running. Now, the browser vendors uh, got smart, not for nat from NAT pinning, but from cross-protocol scripting. So what they did was they started blocking ports and said, you know what, we don't want people basically harassing IRC channels. You know, leave those IRC channels alone, come on. So what they did was they said, all right, we're not gonna allow connections to 6667. So the interesting thing about TCP is that TCP is not a new line based protocol, it's a fixed byte protocol. What you have is something like a source port which is 16 bits and is always 16 bits. But when you're dealing with a browser, you're dealing with essentially your HTML, it's all strings. So what if you go over that 16 bits? What if you add another bit and you add 65,536 to 6667? You end up with a 17-bit number, all right? So what the browser does is it says, oh, so you're trying to connect to this port 72,203? That's not equal to 6667, so I'll let it through. And what happens when it gets down to the TCP IP stack when it's actually dealing with 16-bit shorts? It's gonna say, oh, Dude, you can't have 17 bits here. I'm gonna have to truncate you down to 16 bits. And what happens? You end up with 6667. And now you've just evaded the browser security and are attacking that same exact port that the browser said, I would never allow a connection out on this. Now, I can't take credit for this. This was actually discovered by the, uh, the very respectable security group, GOATC Security. <laughs> so thanks to them for, for that discovery. So this is awesome. Anna visited our malicious link. She submitted this form without even knowing, entirely hidden on the page, and uh, what happened was, now I can hit any port she has. So I quickly do a scan, and what do I find? Just running a web server. What's, the, well, what's on this web server? It's her local journal, it's like her blog. So I read it, and I find out, Twilight. I love Twilight. <laughs> 
I mean, she's a team Jacob fan. I'm more of a team Edward kind of guy. But now I have the information to woo her. So I'm ready to meet her. But before we go on, how do we stop NAT pinning? You know, how do we prevent this from happening to our own systems, our own networks? Well, a couple things you want to do. If you can, have a strict firewall. Um, don't allow outbound, you know, outbound connections that you don't know of. For example, if you don't have children at home, block port 667. Um, client side, you know, run an up-to-date browser. Make sure, you know, browsers always coming out with uh, new, feet, new uh, security features and new bug fixes. They're also coming out with a lot of features too, which have bugs. So you got to you got to weigh that yourself. If you're using something like Firefox, use NoScript. Uh, as soon as NAT pinning came out, the next day they added uh, NAT pinning prevention to NoScript. So it's, if you can, definitely use that software to, to protect your client system. Also, use something like Little Snitch if you can. Little Snitch is for OS X. Uh, it'll say, "Oh, your Firefox is trying to communicate on port 667, which is not normal." If you want to allow that through. Essentially, you want multiple layers of protection, like I would use with Anna. So at this point, I can email Anna, right? I'm ready to meet her. I know she loves Twilight. I love Twilight. We can watch Eclipse together. So I'm going to say, all right, as Robert, I'm logged into Facebook still, and I'm going to message her, and I'm going to have her hit one more link. Now, as Robert, I say, you know what? I want you to meet this guy, Sammy. He's a great guy, and uh, he's going to come over later tonight. Now, the question is, I can't just... I can't just come over because I don't know where she lives. And I obviously can't ask where you live because Robert already knows where she lives. I'm emailing as Robert. So I have to find out exactly where she lives and get there. So how do I do that? All right. The moment you've all been waiting for. Triple X. S. S. <laughs> We're going to do geolocation via triple X S S. What does that even mean? <laughs> okay, so Anna's going to visit our malicious site. I seem to have a lot of malicious sites. <laughs> it's a bad thing. <laughs> Triple X SS will scan her local network and determine the type of router that she's using. Okay. All right. Well, how do you do that? It's actually very simple. There are a million ways to do it. Here's one way. You can just have multiple iframes running on the site, all hidden. And what they do is they just hit different URLs. So if you have a Belkin router, for example, your, the URL for setting it up is 192.168.2.1 slash setup.cgi. Even if there's another router vendor out there using the same IP address, they're probably using a different URL for the actual setup. So you just have to get a specific URL with a specific CGI or whatever uh, web application, and you point to that. Now, if that iframe actually hits that URL, that onload will get hit and will execute that JavaScript. Based off that, we know exactly what type of router she's using. So from there, we then use uh, XSS to load remote JavaScript. All right, well, how many routers have uh, XSS on them? All of them, <laughs> except Apple. They don't even have a web interface. It's kind of annoying, actually. <laughs> so virtually every router has XSS. Why? Well, the router manufacturers think, well, why would, there, why would XSS matter? You know, you can't connect to that. You can't connect to that IP address. It's an internal IP address. The only way you can connect is if you break their WPA2 password, which is going to be very strong. Change me. Or if you're connected locally via Ethernet, in which case you're already owned because they're in your house. <laughs> but no, we have the web browser, right? The web browser is the, the powerful force that allows me to make you execute code. This is why it's a code distribution channel. You are executing my code that is entirely untrusted, that you never even agreed to. Just the fact that you went to that URL, or you went to a website that was somehow attacked by me and is now executing code that I want you to execute. It, it's crazy. So based off, the, based off the router that we detected, we now know exactly which XSS to load. We know, oh, this is a Belkin router, or this is a Verizon Fios router. From there, with the XSS, what we do is we load the remote JavaScript, and the JavaScript does an AJAX call. Now that the AJAX call is, the AJAX call will actually call the uh, local info page of the router. Okay, so what's there? LAN IP address, WAN IP address, router MAC address. And what do we do? Well, we take the router MAC address and we send it back to us. All right, well, why the MAC address? Well, obviously, if we want to look something up, you just bing it. I'll help you. Open your browser, type www.bing.com in your URL bar. When, uh, when Bing loads and that search box loads, loads type in Google. <laughs> and hit enter. 
So...